Good evening and welcome to Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico, Facts and Feats. Good evening, Jorge. How are you doing? How are you, Adam? Very good. I'm happy to be with you again. Oh, I'm thrilled to. I've been really looking forward to this one because I'm a stat nerd. I like the facts and feats, so I'm really excited to hear about the uh, the facts and feats from the Puerto Rican League, which I don't know all that much about. So, um, for the viewers, I'm Adam Dorowski. I uh, work in product for Sports Reference, and I'm joined by. Jorge Colón Delgado, who is the historian of the, uh, the Puerto Rican Baseball League. Welcome again, Jorge. Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, today, tonight, we're going to, a little, a, a sample, a little sample of what happened between 1938 and 1957, what all those Negro Leaguers did in Puerto Rico, how they enrich our history. And uh, as I said, it's just only a small sample of the, one of those feats and facts of, of these great ball players, this is the the the, the portrait of the presentation of uh, facts and feats. That's uh, Johnny Gav uh, Davis, Johnny Davis from Mayagüez. We're going to talk a, a little bit about him later on, and he he was a, a great star in Puerto Rico. He played with Mayagüez, San Dulce, and, and San Juan, and it was uh, one of the great ones, one of those great Negro leaguers who came to Puerto Rico. And we begin our presentation uh, with Satchel Page. A Satchel Page came in 1939-40 with uh, Wayama, but first, in the in the mid 30s, he came with the Brooklyn Eagles of Ifa Manley. The, the manager was Josh Gibson. But his first uh, participation or first he first saw action Puerto Rico in the Puerto Rico Baseball League in 1939 with Wayama. And it, it was a superb season and a calendar of of only 44 games he won 19 games with 208 strikeouts let me let me let me see something here yep uh 19 games and 20 208 strikeout in, in that era, and that the beginning of the league, uh, games were only Sundays, doubleheader. Mm -hmm. So during the week, Satchel practice, went to the movies, but they, he he played uh, only Sundays, doubleheader. In the morning, he pitched. In the afternoon, he played first baseman, and he and he was good offensively too in Puerto Rico. So Satchel Page, I can say that he was the the first great pitcher, although we had in 1938 Raymond Brown too, but Raymond came late in the season. Page was since almost the beginning, and he could he won all those games, 19 games and uh, 208 strikeouts. Right, and that was against only the three losses too. I was uh, looking at his full season numbers that that you do have on NegroLeaguesPuertoRico.com and 205 innings to get those 208 strikeouts and a 1.93 ERA, just a beautiful season from Page. Well, yes, one of the best seasons, maybe the best season from, of any picture in Puerto Rico. You're correct. And if we're talking about Satchel Page, then you gotta talk about the other icon, Josh Gibson. So in 1941-42, he, he was first an average with a 480 batting average. He had 13 home runs that also led the league and his slugging percentage of 959 uh, led the league as well. Those batting and slugging figures are a record for the calendar season of 44 games. Oh, you know, Joshua Gibson, I I, I don't get tired about uh, <laughs> talking about him and writing and investigating because every, every, he, he was a, a a great player. I I, I saw, a, a, you did tweet something today about Biz Mackey? Oh, uh, yes, I did. Yeah, and uh, how, do you, how do you compare Biz Mackey with Josh Gibson, please? 
Oh boy, uh, I would I would probably not compare <laughs> Biz Mackey with Josh Gibson. It's it's hard to compare anybody with Josh Gibson. Um, you know, if I was comparing someone to Biz Mackey, I might look at like uh, Luis Santop. Is probably you know they're they're probably battling each other for number two uh, on the Negro League catcher chart there. But I don't think they're competing with Josh Gibson. Do you think Adam all the, all those research that you had done? Uh... Do you think that Josh Gibson is the best player of all times in the Negro Leagues or maybe in the first three players? Uh, in the Negro Leagues, I would say he probably is. Let's see. Uh, it's certainly among hitters. I mean, it's between him, Charleston, and uh, I don't know, maybe John Henry Lloyd would be uh, the mm -hmm. other one among the three there. Uh, if you mix in pitchers, then you're competing with Satchel and and uh, Smokey Joe Williams as well. So it gets a little little tougher to top that list. But among the hitters, I would certainly put him in the top three. Top three, right? Because his numbers uh, were as catcher, the most difficult position, right? Oh yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, th there's there's some mixed reviews on how he was as a defensive catcher. A lot of people uh, say that he was a very strong receiver and pitchers love to throw to him. There are some that, you know, I, I don't know if maybe they just say, oh, he was a huge slugger like Babe Ruth. So there's no way he could have caught, you know, maybe it's just, they don't, they don't think it's possible for someone like uh, Josh Gibson to catch, but uh, for, for the most part, people that threw to him liked him. Yeah. And Puerto Rico, the ones that, that I got to interview eight, persons that saw him in Puerto Rico and they say that he, he was very fast uh, fielding and he had a strong arm and he liked to you know catch the ball and, and like throw the ball uh in front of him so that so the runners could go to second and then he then he he, he made him out in, in second baseman uh in second base so they in Puerto Rico they say the people that saw him say he was a 5-2 player Yeah, I, there was one thing that I almost mentioned when Paige was on the screen, but I figured I'd bring up now too. Maybe yeah. it's not in line with, you know, celebrating these players, but it has to be said that they, uh, Paige and Gibson each had a season in Puerto Rico where they struggled. And I think that what that does is it probably speaks to the quality of play that was happening on the island where a player like Paige could actually, you know, go under 500 for a year and a player like Gibson actually batted under 200 for a year. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw those numbers. Well, in, in the case of, of, of Paige, I remember that season. It was with Santurce. He was 0-1-4. He was, uh, <clears throat> he was in on the island, Ridger Island, and Pedrin Zorrilla, he was to, he's supposed to come to one, you know, one day, and he he didn't appear, and Pedrin Zorrilla was crazy because he needed them. He needed a satchel, and uh, he didn't look too too good. Mm. On Josh Gibson, that year that you saw, that you see that was, was very poor, he was very sick. Mm. That's when he had the, um, uh, the tumor. Oh, uh, yes, yes. That was 45, 46, you're right. Yeah, yeah. and he was very sick. The Pedrin took him to the hospital, and he was, he, he was a, he had some, some days, Uh, spent some days in the hospital and he was not the, the Josh Gibson that you and me and everybody knows or knew uh, that was not Josh Gibson but uh, I'm, I'm telling you I have read a lot of him lately and I don't know uh, there are not enough words mm -hmm. to, to describe this this ball player and you know uh, Adam our next show I'm going to tell you now this is a surprise but Our next show is going to be Josh Gibson in Puerto Rico. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so next month, uh, all the people are, are watching the show. We want to make a presentation of what what did uh, what Joshua Gibson did in Puerto Rico, beginning with the Brooklyn Eagles until San Dulce. Uh, now the next one, a race pitcher, Luis Cabrera. They, they call him Luis El Tigre Cabrera. El Tigre is a tiger. A tiger. Uh, he was the first pitcher to win 100 games in Puerto Rico. Lifetime, he is fifth in wins with 105, six in strikeouts with 785, and in his pitch with 1,378.1, and eight in earned run average for 343. He won three games versus Ponce in two days, one Saturday, January 20, and two on Sunday, January 21, both in relief. He was a... Uh, 
he had a submarine ball. And I remember I once I talked with Monte Iri and I, 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 we were in Cooperstown in 2006. I said, uh, Mr. Iri, of those small players that you saw in Puerto Rico, who do you think will have made the majors? Puerto Ricans, I said, you know. Well, I, I had to say, I have two. Uh, Luis Cabrera was a great player. He had a screwball, his fingers, he, his fingers touch the ground. It was, he was like, you remember, well, you remember, get the cool way. Oh yeah, oh yeah, submarine but, pitcher. Yeah, but he was like that style and his fingers touch, touch the ground. And he, and he, uh, you can see the, the, the mark in his fingers. And the other one that uh, Monte even told me was uh, Tomas Quiñones. Uh, Tomas, Plan they call him Mio Planchalo Quiñones, a very tall guy, over six feet in that, no, that era, those those time in Puerto Rico, almost nobody was over six feet, six feet of uh, you know of height, and he was a big one, and he was he was a great ball player. But Luis Luis, Luis Cabrera, uh, he played in the thirties, in the forties, in the fifties, and the sixties, four decades. Oh yeah, wow, a great a great a great a player, and uh, he was born in Ponce. But he played almost all his career with uh, Santurce and, and the last year with San Juan. Mm. I'm glad that you brought up uh, Tomas Quinones because that was a name that I, I saw. I, I should say, just like Luis Cabrera, I, I don't know anything, didn't know anything about him before this. And I really uh, was interested in these pitchers that had, or even just players in general, that had long, long careers in Puerto Rico that we only saw in the United States for maybe a season or two. Are there others like Quinones who we were talking, or before we went on, he won two MVPs in a row. Like who are some of the other bigger stars that people might not know from the Puerto Rican league? What I think Tomas Quinones was the best. And uh, we have uh, the Gilbe brothers from Ponce, but, the best player that we had in the Negro Leagues was Francisco Coimbra that you're going to talk in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, our players, no one played more than four years, more than four seasons in, in the United States. I don't know why. Maybe they, they got homesick. Maybe they couldn't deal with the segregation. But we don't have um, 20 ball players. But the best one was uh, Luis Marquez and Francisco Coimbra. As a matter of fact, that's the next one. All right, yeah, let's talk about him. So Pancho, uh, Francisco Coimbra, uh, the only player to lead the league in batting one year, the following year he was the runner up, and then he won it again three years in a row. So yeah, batting title after batting title for Pancho. Uh, and for three consecutive seasons, he did not strike out, which is just absolutely absurd. One of four players in the league to bat 400 twice, the others being Perucho Cepeda, Tatela Vargas, who of course I love, and Willard Brown. Ah, who, who are we talk? Kidding. I love all three. Uh, and he has the second best lifetime average on the island at 337. Now, who who is first again? Uh, it's slipping my mind. Who? Who was first ahead of Coimbra in, in lifetime batting average? Uh, Willard Brown. Oh, okay. yes, of course. <laughs> Willard Brown. Uh, Coimbra. You know, if if the big if the Cooperstown, if Cooperstown one day do, do, does a special induction for Latinos, Coimbra will be a Hall of Famer because he he was great in in every country he played: in Mexico, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, and in the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. So you you can get the, his record in, in seam heads, and he he batted. 300 every year 300 plus every year so he was good here and he was good in the united states it was not coincidence and he, uh coimbre was a heck of a player and i i hope and maybe i'm not going to see it you are going to see it uh cooperstown maybe opens the doors for latinos from the latin leagues and coimbre gets his gets inducted yeah. He was on the preliminary yeah. list for in 2006, right? Yeah, okay. He was in the preliminary list, but in the first round they caught him because I think they caught him uh, because he didn't have the, enough seasons. Mm -hmm. 
Go yeah, I've, I've heard that that happened to a lot of players, even like uh, like uh, even like Doby Moore and Heavy Johnson, who never played in Puerto Rico, but mm-hmm. I've been researching them, and you know they spent a lot of time in the army, so they didn't have as much time in the Negro League. Yeah, I, I saw you, you're writing something of Heavy Johnson. I saw the draft. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to see that to read it. So uh, Coimbra was a great figure. We remember him. You know, Coimbra is a player that. Uh, people keep talking about him no matter what because he you know that he he, he died very tragically his he, his house burned and he was trapped inside he couldn't he didn't find the keys to open the the door so he died but he burned and well it was very tragic but people love Coimbra he was very ex, how you say extro extrovert right Strover, he was very strong, very, uh, very, uh, very friendly, and along with Emilio Navarro, yeah, that you know him, Emilio Navarro, mm-hmm. they were the one two of Ponce. So uh, I, uh, I remember everybody in Puerto Rico has great memories of the great uh, Francisco Pancho Coimbra, as you said. Yeah, he played four. Just going to jump in first. Oh, he played yes, four sorry. seasons in in the Negro Leagues and. Like you said, 330, 313, 360, 345. He was an all-star in two of them. And this was in his 30s, too. He wasn't there in his prime either. So just a, a, a great, great player. Yeah, you know, four seasons, 300 plus in every one, every, each season. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine, no doubt that if, if he had played 10 seasons, because that was, you know, he was steady, very right. steady in his performance. Thank you for those for those uh, facts about Coimbra in the Negro Leagues. The next one, you know him, Raymond Brown, Hall of Famer. In 1938, 39, and 1939, 40, playing for San Juan, Brown had identical record both seasons, 7-0. and 0. In 1947, pitching for Ponce, he defeated the New York Yankees in an exhibition game at Cito Escobar Stadium. He, play, he pitched eight innings and... Uh, and the last inning was another Negro leaguer who pitched, uh, Jose Santiago. They call him Jose Pants Santiago, Pantalones Santiago. Yeah, what well, I, I saw that uh, Ray Brown, in addition, he even had a, another year where he was 12 and 4 with a 1.80 ERA for Ponce. So several great years for, for Raymond Brown over in Puerto Rico. Sorry, yeah. I just keep throwing more and more stats at you because I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Alan, yeah, I, I want to uh, uh, share with you and all the people that are with us. You see, that's the Sector Escobar Stadium. Mm. You see, the fence is a cement, and there is a line of pine trees. To you hit it for you to hit a home run, you have you have to hit it over the trees. And we're talking, he's in the lines, right field line, 385. Oh. And Josh Gibson passed the ball over the trees several times. Oh wow. So yeah, you look at uh, Pancho Coimbra's numbers and you don't see all that many home runs, but that's because I don't think he was a very fast player. So I can imagine the outfielders just played back there and, uh, you know, played the single and made sure he didn't hurt it over their heads. Yeah, it's very, it was very difficult on the, in the, from 1932 to 1942. It was in 1942 that they uh, installed the inner fence. It was an, an inner fence, but uh, I, as a matter of fact, when they installed the, the inner fence, Josh Gibson, Gibson became the first one to hit over 10 home runs. He hit 13. But before that, he only hit six. It was very difficult because it was a, a line of pine trees all over the fence. And we, when we give uh, the presentation of Josh Gibson, I have an aerial view of the park, how it was, and you're going to see how many trees there were in that uh, around the fences. Luke Easter, ah, gosh, look at him. He, there's there's very few players in the world that they could have signed to replace Josh Gibson, but this is the guy right here. But yeah, in 48-49, playing for Mayaguez, he led the league in batting 402, slugging 751, doubles 27, triples 9, runs 81. And of course, he led the league in all of those. He was named MVP. Bat, uh, he had nine consecutive hits 
matching the league record, nine straight trips to the plate. And uh, I noticed too that uh, he led the league later, like uh, I think it was probably almost a decade later, he was in in, in the uh, country and he led uh, the league in home runs at the age of 40. Is that what, what it was? Yeah. Unbelievable. Just uh, yeah, you know that you know that when he he, uh, he came here to Puerto Rico to play with Mayagüez, Alfonso Valdez was the owner of the Mayagüez, and when the the uh, reporters asked him, "Hey, how, who how is Lucius Easter?" He said, "Well, he's better than Willard Brown." And I, I think uh, it, we have to mention that uh, the first player to hit a home run by center field. In Polo Ground, the Polo Grounds was Luke Easter. Luke Easter, there are only four Luke Easter, Lucius Easter, uh, uh, Lou Brock, Joe Adok, and Henry Arrow. Those, oh, only, wow. those are the only four that hit a home run in the Polo Grounds at 483. Uh, <laughs> Lucius Easter did it as a Negro League game. You know, it wasn't on the big leagues, mm -hmm. but he was a very strong player. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's he's an interesting one because he didn't make it to make I say make it. He wasn't allowed to play for Cleveland until 1949 when he was already 33 years old. And what's surprising when you read into his history more is that he didn't even join the Negro Leagues until he was 31. So mm -hmm. it's like he spent like that whole decade of the 20s. He was just working a job and work playing for the the local team and just you know one of the greatest hitters in the country wasn't in a professional league and it's just a, a very different time where that could happen um you have uh, his record or in base uh, here in baseball reference in big leagues in front I, of you? I, I do yes yeah can, can you tell me there's a there's a couple of seasons that he had he had great seasons in the big leagues yeah, it, it, when he came up in, in 1949, he only played 21 games, uh, mm -hmm. so not much happened there. But then right away in 1950, 141 games, 28 home runs and 107 runs batted in. He hit 27 home runs the next year, 31 the next. And we're talking he's already 36 years old. So, you know, he's he's got a big body. It's it's winding down already. So it makes you wonder, like, what what could he have done in his prime? And, you know, we see a glimpse of that in the Negro League stats that we have, too. In 1948, he hit six home runs to lead the league in just 41 games, slugged 549. That led the league. It was just a, a monster at the plate. Um, yeah. And we we missed out on, like like you said, with Coimbra, probably a Hall of Fame level player. Luke Easter certainly, I think, would fit that description as well. And when, when, when all this information that we have now, all the investigation that uh, those great historians in the United States have done, all the great work, Lester, Phil Dixon, uh, Ashwell, and you name them, uh, the more I learn and the more I read, the more I get sad because, you know, I, it's very sad that this, this player didn't, didn't go to the big leagues in that, those moments because history will be different. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And the one nice thing about Easter is he was able to make it for those those three years that he uh -huh. could really show what he could do. There are so many, though, that didn't get the chance. Like you think of like a, a Quincy Troop who like oh, yeah. made it at the very end when he was like already 39 years old as a catcher. It's like he, he must have been thinking, you know, if only I could have done this 10 years ago and really showed you what I could do. And, you know, he was also one of the lucky one lucky so to speak that did get that opportunity where so many didn't yeah yeah i agree well then we have uh, another great one here barney brown most wins in two consecutive seasons with 32 one of two pitchers with two consecutive 15 plus wins the other ones was uh billy bird with some tools and Caguas. and he's the only imported pitcher selected mvp twice 1941 42 and 1946 47. wow that's the so the only uh pitcher from outside of uh the uh puerto rico that's that's amazing yeah i was just looking at barney brown the other day just you know several years as an all-star in the u.s and i had no idea that he dominated on such a level in puerto rico as well just you know a, another great great pitcher there's there's so many from from the negro leagues that you know, I, I feel like the pitchers don't get as much publicity in the negro leagues because the offensive stats were so 
eye popping, but I keep saying, you know, somebody had to pitch to these guys. Somebody had to throw the pitches to Josh Gibson or to Pancho Coimbra or to Luke Easter. Uh, so, you know, the fact that, you know, some of these pitchers can come away with a, a respectable ERA, a respectable record after that is uh, impressive. Yeah. Artie Wilson. Oh my goodness. Uh, what a talented player in 1948, 49 as player manager of my he led the league in hits 126 was third in batting at 373 and runs scored with 69. Gosh, Artie Wilson is another that, uh, he's one of those players that just really got caught in the middle. Like mm -hmm. he, he was, he, he didn't play long enough in the Negro Leagues to establish himself as one of the stars of the Negro Leagues. Although, if you look at his five years that he did play there, absolutely incredible. And he only had 19 games in the National League with the New York Giants. But then he played many, many years in, in the Pacific Coast League and, and did well year after year. And it's just a uh, he, he was still a productive player, but teams just wouldn't make the room to put him on the roster. And he's one of those guys that just got, you know, 19 games and he only collected, you know, four hits and 22 trips and, you know, he's done. You know, he didn't get another chance after that. Yeah. And you know, Adam, <coughs> sorry, that season, 1948-49, he was, he did all those, he got the, all those numbers mm -hmm. uh, and he won the championship. Yeah, he won the championship in 1948-49 uh, as a shortstop. Right. So it was very difficult. And uh, he played shortstop and he uh, won all, he hit all those hit on the 26. And they, they tell me that he was superb fielding. Uh, there's a, there's a, a name you know this this ship that uh, takes the mines from the sea. Mines explosive. Oh right, right. Okay, yeah. How do you say in English? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in 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 in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico they they call it barreminas. But in, in English, let me see barreminas in English. Let me see barreminas. Yeah, because it's totally slipping my mind here. In Spanish, in in Spanish, in English. Mine sweeper. Oh yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> they call him mine sweeper, Barreminas, because so he got to every ball. Mm -hmm. I love he it. Was, he was a uh, people love him too. Well, all, all of them, they people love them. But he, his best year was with Mayagüez. When he came with with, with Santulce in 1954, 55, that was the, the year of Willie Mays. And uh, he was not, he was too old. And uh, he was playing second baseman. Mm. And and uh, Herman Franks was the manager and he wanted to, you know, uh, let him uh, take him out of the, 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 the team because he was not, some, not he was not, he was very uh, bad. He wasn't not producing. And Pedrin Sorria didn't want Pedrin Sorria never uh, uh, let lose any player. And the, the, when uh, Alti Wilson broke a figure, then they, they he left the team and they, they brought up Billy Garner from the New York Giants and then Ronnie Sanford and the team won the championship. But that was the last time that Alti Wilson went, went to Puerto Rico. Just to paint a picture of uh, what type of player uh, Artie Wilson was when he was having that huge year with okay. Mayak Wiz. The five years before it, 44 to 48, he was an all-star four out of five years, and he hit 369 for the Birmingham Black Barons across those five years. And then he had his amazing year with Mayak Wiz, and then he was signed into the Pacific Coast League where he collected 211 hits and hit 347 for the year. So that's that's like top tier player right there and so that's another one that he was very steady and then the next year 1950 he had 264 hits in the pacific oh coast God. league in 196 games they played a very long season that year but holy moly incredible <laughs> right incredible for a shortstop yep yeah very good right thank you for that information and now here comes the the king Wheeler brown 
only player to win two triple crowns in Puerto Rico, three batting titles, led, led the league in home runs three years in a row. One of two players, the other one is Perucho Cepeda, to bat 400 in two positions. He did it as a second base, second baseman and outfielder. His lifetime average is 350, number one, his first. He's first in slugging and fifth in home runs with 101. What a player, Wheeler Brown. You know, it's Wheeler Brown and everybody else. <laughs> he, didn't, no. he wasn't lucky. He wasn't lucky in the big leagues, right? You have the his record in the big with San Luis Browns? No? Yeah, he was he didn't get a very very much of a chance as well. I what's unfortunate about the uh St. Louis Browns is they signed two amazing they signed him and Hank Thompson right away. Mm -hmm. And then they played like a total of 40 games and then they were sent back and it was just a huge, huge miss on the, the St. Louis Browns part there. Yeah. I mean, he, we have a thing on baseball reference called black ink mm -hmm. and that's when you lead the league in something uh, it's bold and we call that black ink. I think the term originally came from Bill James. Now his black ink score is 128 and that is fourth all time among all batters in all major leagues, Negro leagues, everything combined. Fourth all time because he led the league in so many things. So we're talking like, I think it's like Barry Bonds, Babe Ruth, probably Ty Cobb and mm -hmm. Willard Brown. It's just unbelievable. And then he comes to St. Louis, they give him 21 games. He hits 179, of course, new league, new stadiums, dealing with all sorts of hate from the crowd. Of course, he struggled a little bit in his first few games, but that was enough, and they sent him back. And then he went back to the Kansas City Monarchs and just continued to crush the ball. I, I have heard or read that he he, he got a uh, segregation really affected him. You know, loneliness. Hmm. He couldn't deal with the loneliness and the people screaming things to him, and he couldn't. Uh, you know, that affected his, his game. I right. read that. I, I can't imagine because, you know, even playing in the Negro leagues with, with Kansas city, like that team was beloved. Like I can imagine that more than others, maybe they were sheltered from it a little bit because they had such a strong following. So yeah, I can't imagine like going from, you know, being the star of like this incredible team and then, you know, having to put up with all that. It's And, and then, and then, and you, you remember the last uh, program we had, that he went on, he was invited to the governor's mansion. You remember, right? So right. he was he was a huge star in Puerto Rico. He was a huge star with Kansas City Monarchs. Then he goes to the big leagues with all those things that he had to deal, and he, he couldn't he couldn't deal with them. He couldn't deal with them. He, he it affected his game. That's why he didn't produce. Yeah, and I I think that you know you understand why players like you know Wild Bill Wright, uh, Bernice Wright, he would like go to Mexico and. Yep fall in love with it. You know, he, he didn't have to put up with the same things that he did in the United States. And uh, yeah, it's Willard Brown. I, I love looking at his, his stats in, in, uh, in uh, Puerto Rico, because if you combine his, well, I guess he only had the, the 21 uh, games in the uh, American league, but his major league record is now a 350 batting average. And of course, what's his batting average in Puerto Rico? 350. 350. Consistent wherever he went. I love it. Yeah, he was. He was a, a, a great one. And, and uh, they call him here Ese Hombre, the man. Mm. Here comes Ese Hombre with a round. A great, a great figure. And uh, we we uh, remember him a lot. And and I hope that with these programs and these things that we are doing, uh, people will know what more about this great ball player, Willard Brown, what he did in Puerto Rico. And he was inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2006. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, he entered with the Kansas City Monarchs cap, but in the magazine, in the Armory, he was with the Santurce uniform. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Next one. Oh, this is one I have loved learning about his career in Puerto Rico. Bob Thurman, the first 200 home runs, did that in 1956. Most with uh, most 10 plus home run seasons uh, with seven. So that's that. Yeah, that's just a lot of years with very uh, high productivity in, in Puerto Rico. Only player with 100 plus hits in three seasons. Lifetime, he's first in home runs. So 
more than Willard Brown with 120 and runs batted in 566, third in slugging 525, and in total bases with 1,562. It's fourth in triples at 61, seventh in batting 313, doubles 149, runs 527, and ninth in hits 931. And for good measure, as a pitcher, he was 39 and 32, which I didn't actually know he pitched in the country until today. So there we go. Bob Thurman, just uh, maybe the uh, if if Willard Brown is is the Babe Ruth, then is he the Lou Gehrig then? Yep. Yep. You know, uh, my my uh, you, I think, you know, him. Uh, Tom Van Heining, he wrote two books about the, the Puerto Rico Winter League in English. And he made an article about, and I, and I agree with him, I think Bob Thurman was better than Willard Brown. But he was always in the shadow of Willard Brown. And he was introvert. Mm -hmm. Willard Brown was extrovert. Right. Look the record of Bob Thurman in the big leagues with Cincinnati. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. Just the fact that he didn't debut until he was almost 38 years old. Yep. And then even at 40 years old, he's hitting 16 home runs in just 74 games. Uh, so in part-time duty, you know, that's the thing. Like the Bob Thurman you see on, on like the baseball cards or in the records, it's, it's his late thirties. It's not the, the peak Bob Thurman. Now we do have the three years that he played with the Homestead Grays. And uh, with those in 114 games, we've got, you know, a 329 batting average, uh, 486 slugging. He's starting to look a little bit more like the Bob Thurman that we saw in Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, two things. Didn't he lead the league in triples? National League? I uh, One year? I no? don't think so. No? But he he uh, Bob Thurman hit a lot of triples in one year, in the with the Cincinnati. Can you check that out? Uh, I see it. Uh, the most he had was four, but that was again in like only two hundred plate appearances. Okay. And the other thing is, I think that Bob Thurman is in the what you say a little bit of while about Artie Wilson in the mix up. Yeah, like in between, didn't have an, a long enough career in the Negro Leagues, or in the American League or National League. Uh, so just kind of caught in between there. And yeah, that gap that he had in between the Homestead Grays years and the Cincinnati Reds years was from 1948 to 55. So that's, he went from like playing with the Grays at 31 to 38 with the Reds. So there was just a, you know, a lot of playing in, in Puerto Rico in between playing in uh, the Pacific Coast League, like so many of the the players did when they weren't able to, to make it into the they weren't allowed into the AL and NL. Uh, I should say, like so many of them uh, were were able to to play at that level, though. Yeah, yeah it's just. Yeah, it's and, and what what I got uh, the season, I got a little bit confused. You you got that 1957 with, with 40 years, he hit 16 homers, right? In only 190 at bats, that's high. Yeah, that's a high ratio. Yeah, that's a 542 slugging percentage, even though his batting average was uh, hovering around 250. He was getting a lot of power that year. I was in uh, Kansas City catching a game uh, this summer, and I was very lucky to catch the game with Larry Lester. Oh. And one, one of the names we were talking about was, was Bob Thurman. And uh, he was like, tell me about his fielding numbers. So I was like looking up like – just like the number of assists that he had in his brief time in the major leagues. And, you know, that type of thing was just, it, it's unbelievable. He's like, yeah, he had a rifle arm and, and the the major leagues did not get enough of it. Uh, Cause yeah. he was just a, a top tier player. Well, he, when, when, when Clemente got to Santos in 1952, 1953, 1954, uh, he was teammate of Bob Thurman and Clemente played left field. Bob Thurman was the right fielder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in the in the major leagues, well, in, in, with Cincinnati, uh, only looking at a uh, is this only Cincinnati? No, just that's just in general. In 150 games we have in the outfield, 15 assists. That's just a uh, uh, a great arm. He's cutting down a lot of runners. And he uh, they they they, they uh, he had a nickname in Puerto Rico, the Owl, El Buo, mm -hmm. El Mucaro. 
the owl because he pitched very good uh, night games and the first night game in puerto rico he won the game defeated mayagüez and johnny davis mm. and he got that nickname because he nobody saw the ball on the night had the, the fast he threw through and they they call him bob and mucaro thurman so he was a uh, that's what I say that he was a better player than Willa Brown because he was more complete, more athletic uh, than Willa Brown. But Willa Brown was Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. It's the same, the same uh, scenario. You know, uh, he was over uh, shadow of Babe Ruth. Mm -hmm. Great player. Well, that's a great one. Go oh ahead. gosh. Oh, is it my turn? I lost track. Yeah, yeah, I used to turn. All right, Billy Bird. Uh, I I love Billy Bird. One of two pitchers, the other being Barney Brown, with 15-plus wins in two seasons in a row. Uh, the only imported pitcher, uh, with, <laughs> imported pitcher with more accumulative wins in three consecutive seasons, so nobody else from outside the country had more than 40 wins over a three-year span. And the only pitcher with 200 innings twice. Uh, Billy Bird is just... Uh, you know, he was just known as, as daddy by uh, Roy Campanella, just a father figure and everything you read about him. Just he just seems like the nicest guy. And I'm just kind of curious to hear what his experience was like in Puerto Rico. He came with some tools at first. And I don't know why Pedrin Sorria didn't sign him for the 19. Uh, he came with Santulce in 1939, 40, the first season of Santulce. Mm -hmm. And he won the first uh win of Santulce was with Willie Bird on the mound. And he, uh, he had that record of 15 plus wins. And the next year, he didn't sign with Santulce. He signed with Caguas. Mm. And Caguas defeated Santulce in seven games, four to three. And I think that was the difference. If Santulce would have Willie Bird, the story would be different. But I don't know. I have never found uh, the, the reason why Pedrin didn't sign Billy Bird for that second season. Yeah, he I, yeah. he's another one. Like if if you're looking at like the best pitchers outside of the Hall of Fame from the Negro Leagues, I, I'm a Billy Bird fan. Uh, if you're looking at like the, the 1920 to, to 48 era. And you know, uh, something that I don't know if you have noticed, maybe yes. That he has his name is catching up. I have seen people writing and talking about more of Billy Bird for the Hall of Fame. Well, I think it's the stats. Like yeah. the stats are so easily accessible now. And just looking at his Negro League stats on on uh, Baseball Reference, he's got a uh, one over sixty percent of his decisions, three point three three ERA, which is a one hundred and thirty ERA plus. And again, you know, he's he's pitching to some really really difficult hitters here, and uh, you know, he won. An ERA title. He had led the league in wins three times, even in 1948, the last season of of the the major league uh, Negro leagues. He led the league in wins, 1.68 ERA. So he he just really impresses. And then if they look at the numbers in Puerto Rico across five, uh, three seasons, you know, 580 innings, he was 40 and 24 with a 2.17 ERA. So this is a guy who did it everywhere. Everywhere. Yep. Yep, and then I think I hope that uh, they get they give him a chance, you know, to evaluate his record for mm -hmm. the Hall of Fame. I'm talking about the Hall of Fame. Just a little information. Last week, uh, last Sunday, Tony Oliva was inducted. That's number fifty-five from Puerto Rico Baseball League. Wow, that is amazing. Fifty-five persons that saw action in Puerto Rico as ball players, commentators, or umpires are the hall of fame cooperstown and uh that's the 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 biggest amount in any country of the caribbean so uh, i got very very happy tony tony oliva led the league here in puerto rico in 1964 and then he went to the united states and won all those titles so very happy for our league that we have 55 persons in the hall of fame yeah i started a a, a good conversation on twitter Yesterday, the day before, I was looking at uh, Baseball 101 uh -huh. and saw the numbers of Jose Cruz in in Puerto Rico, and I shared those out because 
you know, it was amazing to see again, like a, such a long career in Puerto Rico. So there was a lot of at bats. I think it was something like 4,000 at bats or something to, to think that like he had this long major league career, but then he had like another career <laughs> on top of yeah. it. It's, it's absolutely uh, incredible. Yeah. And you know that, uh, I, I love this talking about uh, uh, statistics. Mm -hmm. War, I love war. And if you look out, uh, look up the war of Jose Cruz, he's right there with mm -hmm. Mini also and David Ortiz. Mm -hmm. So he, he uh, before war, nobody knew Jose Cruz, but with that statistic, that metric, He has good numbers and he can be, could be considered in the future for the Hall of Fame. Especially if the Hall of Fame gets uh, a little bit more open about considering leagues outside of the U.S. Because yep. then, like I said, you have a whole additional 21-year career that you can add to Jose Cruz's record. And suddenly <laughs> he becomes, uh, it's hard to, hard to come up with a reason not to put him in. Well, Jose Cruz is the second one in homers in Puerto Rico with 119. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. That, but yep. yeah, he yeah. didn't have to hit in the Astrodome anymore, so he was blasting him in Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. 119, <laughs> and he uh, he he hit 120, but that 120, the game was rain out. Mm. Nobody told him that the record was 120, so he would he, he told oh. me if I knew that I was one from the record, two for a new record, I would keep playing. But he retired. Mm. Great guy, Jose Cruz. We're going to have to do a program about metrics. <laughs> Certainly. Okay. Let's go to this one. Uh, Luis Marquez. Uh, this is a great one. Uh, Big, Victor Peyot Power, Big Power, Orlando Cepeda, Nino Escalera told me he was the greatest ball player in Puerto Rico, among Puerto Ricans. Uh, they love him to see him practice. He was the first one to hit to to bat a thousand hits lifetime. He is first in hits with uh, 1,206 in doubles. He is first two with 235 in runs, 768 and total bases, 1,864. He is second in triples with 66 stolen bases, 217 runs, batted in. Uh, uh, sorry. Runs batted in 500 and seven in homers with 97. He was the first black player signed by the New York Yankees in 1949. And when I say first black player, first black player among American, Afro-American and Afro-Latinos. And the first black Puerto Rican uh, with the Boston Braves in 1951. You got the record of uh, Luis Marquez in Seamheads? I Yeah, I have I have him on 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 Baseball Reference. Here oh, that's I was also, oh, sorry, sorry. I was, no, I was also looking at it. Uh, no, don't worry. I love Seamheads. Uh, that's where we get our data from. So, um, but yeah, in the Negro Leagues, uh, he had a 311 batting average across just three years. But he was an All Star in two of them, and he was very young, like age 20, 21, and 22. Then in the National League, he only had 99 games and he hit 182. And it was very similar to what we were talking about with Artie Wilson. And uh, I think it was Bob Thurman we were talking about with this too, where it was caught in the middle. He spent a lot of time in the minors, like uh, in AAA and the Pacific Coast League, hit 305 in over 1,500 games in the, the minor leagues in the U.S., uh, 145 uh, home runs. 1700 hits so he had a very very long career uh after the the national league essentially just didn't give him a, enough of a chance yeah and as and i said to i said to you i told you Luis marquez and francisco going without the top puerto ricans uh in the new york leagues and in the uh, talking about Luis marquez he's also a player in the mix-up like you said mm -hmm. yep He was exactly. in the middle of, of everything, you know. And uh, I talked to Luis Olmo, who was the outfielder of Brooklyn Dodgers, and I said, uh, Luis, what happened with Marquez? He said, he played too much with people. You know, he made too much, paid too much attention to what they screamed to him. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, they say something, and he, had, he wanted to prove that he was not that, that he could mm -hmm. do it. And he didn't concentrate because a, a, a player like with those numbers, why didn't he? He got a chance with the Yankees. 
you know, they signed him and he didn't, uh, you, if you look his record, his record in Babel's reference, he didn't have, uh, never could get a hold of, of his, of his uh, big league career. And it was because he played too much attention to what mm -hmm. fans yelled him. Yeah, uh, just there's so many of those players that were caught in the middle, and it's that could be a whole topic in and of itself. Is like the you know the players who played half and half here and half and half there, but uh, luckily in a lot of times we're finding they played long careers in Puerto Rico, where mm -hmm. we can see the the extensive uh, careers that they had and, and the level that they really played at. That uh, Luis Marque, I don't know if you know, if you. You knew, uh, if you know it, he died tragically. He, the the husband of his daughter killed him. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, because he was hitting uh, his his wife, and they told him he was playing domino in the in the corner with a, a shop there. They, 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 a person came to to tell him that they were hitting his daughter, and he came to defend his daughter and. The guy, uh, the guy killed him, and they have never found the guy. Oh yet. my gosh! So he's on the loose yet. Luis Marquez, he has a stadium name after him, and uh, we remember too. Uh, Luis Marquez, we have in our sport memory. You know, mm -hmm. we have a very, very. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, I can't say. You don't have to talk too much when we're talking about baseball. And always his name and Francisco Coimbre, they name it immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, boy, part low. Oh, what a what a, a very interesting one here. In 3940, he didn't allow any earned runs in 38 consecutive innings. In 40, uh, this is my favorite one here. In 4041, became the first and only pitcher to win a batting title with a 443 batting average. And this is as a pitcher. And he's one of two pitchers to bat 400 in a season. Now I'm curious who the other pitcher was that batted 400. Uh, who was? I'm going to get it now. I'm going to tell you. But uh, who was the other pitcher? <laughs> oh, my God. You got me. Sorry Let to do me. that to you. No, 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 no. No, yeah. Who was the other one? 400. Oh, well, we get the name when we get the comments, okay? All right, sounds good. Answer that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ray Pablo, you know, you know the the picture that we oh, have. Yes. Uh, uh, the the fans, white fans, you know, uh, carrying him. That's one of the best. The, the one of the, the pictures that I, I like most because that that there we is a proof about how Puerto Ricans treated Negro leaguers uh, from the United States. And Pablo, you you see him very scared, but uh, yeah, he was a great a great one, a great pitcher. And as you say, he's one of two pitchers to bat four hundred or plus in a season. And the next one, Johnny Davis, they call him in Gaucho here. He talk, he he played guitar. Uh, one of two players to throw a no hitter, led the league in homers, and be MVP. The other one was Tomas Quinones. In 1947-48, he batted eight hits in a row. Oof. And this this all these players were very versatile. You know, they 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 feel they pitch, they they batted. They, they had to they they were I think they got that from the Negro Leagues because they had to mm -hmm. earn money and do what they had to do to earn money. So they were very, very, very versatile here when they when they came here uh, the same case of uh Satchel Page that he played first baseman. Uh, so Johnny Davis, we, we, we said a, a story about him, a little girl that was in the hospital that was a great fan of him. And he didn't, she didn't catch him. And uh, they told him that, that she, want, he, she wanted to meet Johnny Davis. And Davis made the, the arrangement to visit the, the little girl. So that was the how baseball was in Puerto Rico with all these new leaguers. Man, this is a favorite of you. Oh yes, yeah. I was I was just uh, distracted looking at uh, 
Johnny Davis's Negro League career. Oh, then, yeah. Wait, let's go to the Johnny Davis again. Okay. No, so, I just uh, nine years in a row, all with the Newark Eagles. That's not a that's not something you see too often. And uh, yeah, he batted 303 with the team. And one thing that stood out to me was he had a lot of walks. You didn't see that too, too much uh, back then. But uh, yeah, he even led the league in walks once and had a nice 386 on base percentage. Just a, a great hitter, 137 OPS plus in uh, nine years in the Negro Leagues. Just a, yeah. And a pitcher too in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Just great player. A great player. Johnny Gaucho Davis. Gaucho is the cowboy in Argentina. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why, because he looked like an Argentinian cowboy and he played guitar and he, he liked to play his guitar when they were fiesta among ball players. Uh, okay, let's go to your one of your oh, favorites. I'm, I'm ready. George Scales. Oh, boy. So the only imported manager with more championships won. Uh, he's, he's got six, five with Ponce, four consecutively, and one with Santorce. And of course, uh, as a player in the Negro Leagues, he played over 20 years, just was a massive hitter for an infielder um, and it, just a complete head scratcher of how a player with his record has managed to stay out of the Hall of Fame. But hopefully that'll be rectified soon. Did he ever play in Puerto Rico or just as a manager? Yeah, he played. He played with uh I think he came with the New York Black Yankees. I'm not sure, but he came in the 30s and he played too with Aguadilla and he was the first man in Aguadilla. Mm. But I'm sure that he played in the 30s with uh New York Black Yankees and I'm going to I'm going to investigate but maybe the Brooklyn Eagles when Josh Gibson was the manager. So he, he he came two or three times before the professional baseball league. I got the answer of the, oh, of the, of the other picture. Yeah. And who was that? I'm gonna tell you. Uh no one. It was a mistake. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> the only pitcher to bat 400 plus was Roy Palo. Uh, I, I look. That's why. That's why I got. A little bit you say, man, what other pitcher did that? <laughs> it's a mistake, so sorry about that. Maybe Bob Thurman did it. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh but uh Ray Paulo, pitcher, pitcher, Ray Paulo, because mm. Bob Thurman was more right fielder than the pitcher, although yeah. his numbers were mm. great. So what we have here, you got your scale. So just for the fact, uh the only pitcher that batted 400 plus was Floyd Pardo. Okay. Got it. Uh, okay. Now, the 300 plus average and 500 plus slugging club lifetime of the four, three were Negro Leaguers. Willard Brown, Orlando Cepeda didn't play in the Negro Leagues, Bob Thurman, and Buster Clarkson. Those are the only four players with a 300 plus lifetime average and a 500 plus slugging so that's very that's a very difficult uh feat and only mm. four had done it in a in a in a in a in a baseball puerto rico who was was so tough so uh, very competitive so only four did that and then uh, so this one is the awards and titles won by negro league players in puerto rico between 38 and 57 and 11 MVP awards, uh, 14 batting titles, 21 home run titles. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nine runs batted in crowns, three triple crowns, 13 400 plus seasons, 11 win, uh, uh, win leaders, uh, 11 ERA leaders, and 12 strikeout leaders. So just so many players from the Negro Leagues dominating the leaderboards in Puerto Rico. Yep. That home run one. Wow. Yeah, that's between uh... – Bob Thurman and and Willard Brown. Oh yeah, they have the <laughs> half of both titles. Mm -hmm. So you can see all of the awards and titles at NegroLeaguesPuertoRico.com/awards-2022. 
dash titles. And I'll tell you, you should definitely check out NegroLeaguersPuertoRico.com. I've enjoyed spending a lot of time on it. The player profiles have all the career stats, as well as a lot of these facts and feats that we're discussing today. They come right after the, the table of player stats. And if there's a player that you don't find on the Negro Leaguers or Puerto Rico uh, site, uh, I've noticed that Baseball101.com tends to have them. It's not in English, but uh, it, there's a little bit more data there too that uh, I've started using that one for for researching players as well. Oh, that's glad to hear. I'm happy to hear that, uh, Adam. You know, that's since the beginning, that's the, our main goal, that people like you, all ex experts like you, historians and fans in Puerto Rico and the United States know the history of Puerto Rico, the rich history of our baseball. And you know something? We have 14 comments. Oh, do we? I, I'm not yeah. able to see them. <laughs> let's, let's see, look, oh, let's, there we go. There they are. <laughs> let's see. All right. All right. We got Jimmy Camacho who says, what an awesome show. Uh, looks like he had mentioned uh, name Ho Jose Aceda. Jose Gonzalez Taboada. Tremendo programa. Great program. Yes, yes. Our friend Tom Van Heine. Ed Panas said, good evening, Jorge and Adam. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. I uh, appreciate that. Oreste Moreo said, super interesting. I'm so glad to hear that because I have found it super interesting as well. Uh, and Jimmy says, what an awesome show. Marcial says, spectacular. So happy to hear that. I'm going to let you take Jaime's comment here. What, what, what? Uh, the one that Jaime did, sorry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, yes, he says, Uh, hello from the Sola Morales. Sola Morales is the par ballpark of Caguas. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, he's, uh, thank you, Joe Jorge and Mr. Dawrowski, for those interesting facts about our Negro Leaguers that play in the island. Uh, Baseball Ahora. Baseball Ahora is uh, the show with Raul Ramos that I have Mondays and, and Thursday. My, my friend and my colleague, uh, Raul Ramos. Gracias, Raul, for your comments. Uh, Birds should be in the hall, yes, I agree. And, and Bob Thurman was a pitcher when he batted 400, yes. But he was not full-time pitcher. Mm. Yeah. But you can say that Bob Thurman batted 400. Let, let's check out Bob Thurman. Yeah, I'm bringing it up now. He batted 400 in 47-48. So I don't know if he did any pitching that year as well. 47, 47, 48, or maybe, maybe, but he didn't have the, he wasn't, I maybe I, I didn't include him because he, he wasn't so much picture right. as Roy Pardo, but you have a point. <laughs> uh, he may, when he batted 400, I have to see how many innings he pitched. So that's a, that's, that's a great point. Thank you, Jose. Jose is a great friend, a professor at the uh, University of Puerto Rico. Thank you, Jose, for your comment. Uh, so, um, Adam, we have here uh, our work where we, we can see them. Please inform. Yes, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico. If you subscribe, you'll be able to see when we have our next one on Josh Gibson in Puerto Rico, which I'm very excited about learning more about uh, his trip to the island, his many trips to the island uh, as a player and manager. Manager, yes. Most time he managed, he was in Puerto Rico. You should follow twitter.com slash Negro Leaguer. Negro Leaguers PR, uh, and that is the the official Twitter of the Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico website. I recommend you follow that as well. Get some information about the players that we're talking about today. And as I said before, NegroLeaguersPuertoRico.com. I love it. Uh, there's so much great information about these players, uh, from Artie Wilson to Bob Thurman to Billy Bird. You can find their stats and all the the feats that they accomplished, as well as read some very interesting articles about the the different players that came over. You know, Adam, I enjoy a lot because uh, we got to talk. It was like a conversation between friends. And, and uh, thank you for so many that facts you, you added. You made you enrich, you enrich the presentation. And we hope that uh, the next programs will be the same or better than this one. So I, I appreciate what you did today. And all our friends that are, we got us, some of them here today. 
all the comments. Thank you so much to be with us. And as I say at the middle of the program next month, I have to I have to uh, talk with Alan which Wednesday is going to be, but it's going to be a presentation about Josh Gibson in Puerto Rico. You're going to love it. I interview eight persons who saw Josh Gibson in Puerto Rico. And uh, just a preview. In Ponce, the guy hit a Ponce, it was uh, the Charles Chateri Stadium, and there was a river on the uh, around the, the park. And uh, he batted the ball two times, twice to the river, Rio Portugues. <laughs> and I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I look for the scale in Google. At least six hundred feet. And there's so many, you know, people. You, you're gonna like it. You're gonna get. I'm not gonna talk about Tom uh, about Josh Gibson today, but you're gonna like it. So, uh, Adam, thank you. And uh, you, please say thank goodbye. You. Yeah, thank you so much. I learned so much from this. I, I love talking about this. So I appreciate this uh, chat between friends as well. Yeah. So until next month. Take care.